Well, it's a sincere, heartfelt pleasure for me to spend time with Adam today. Um, he and I go back many years. When I first uh, met Adam, uh, he was a youngster. He's still kind of a youngster relative to me. But it's been wonderful for me to watch his career grow because he's such a bright and capable and well-rounded human being in so many ways. So um, pleasure and thanks, Adam, for joining. Let me read just a little bit of your background uh, because it's impressive. You're a role model for um, professional development and, and your contributions to healthcare, friend. So I'm going to embarrass you with a little bit of, of your background. Um, I didn't realize that you finished a double major in physics and math at the University of Utah. That was powerful. Way to go, friend. Um, he went on to study and get his PhD in medical informatics at Columbia. Uh, his advisor was a brilliant contributor, George Ripsack, uh, so great mentorship there. Then he went on and came back from Columbia, back to Intermountain Healthcare, and studied under another luminary in medical informatics with Paul Clayton. And uh, Adam led the implementation of our primary care and emergency medicine systems while he was there. Um, he and I worked very closely on the development of the Intermountain Data Warehouse which was pretty novel at the time. This was in the late uh, 1990s. So um, he and I have been connected uh, around analytics for a long time. Uh, and then he went on to be you know, faculty and professor up at University of Washington, where he's doing great things, not just at the University of Washington, but he's also um, doing a lot of things nationally with AHRQ and the academic medical centers in the informatics space. So. What we get with Adam today is someone who is brilliant, brilliantly smart academically and also combines that with really boots on the ground, pragmatic healthcare operations. So it's, um, it's an honor and it's a lot, of, a lot of fun to spend time with you, Adam. Thanks for joining, friend. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dale. Um, just testing. Can everyone hear me? Yep. At least Dale can. Okay, great. So uh, huge thanks. I, I think that... Um, what I what I reflected on as Dale was introducing me there is um, that I was probably most grateful for is the reflection on the people that I've worked with in my career. And that's probably um, I, I, that and it's been a while since I've been called a youngster, but just <laughs> reflecting on the people that I've worked at worked with in my career that it's been an honor. And Dale is one of those that it's been an honor to work with. And and I feel like I've in some degrees been chasing Kind of the, the ideas that he had back when we worked together at Intermountain for a long time and maybe all this will be as a validation of that but if nothing else just a little bit of different perspective on it so i want to start uh, as mentioned i'm up in uh, seattle uh, we've made the news a lot uh, recently in terms of um, uh, autonomy and what's going on but i, I want to go back a little farther into our history to begin with and and kind of the what what created the air uh, you know what created the, the civilizations around this area so what you're seeing here is an image of a chinook salmon and early settlers in the area were drawn to um the puget sound uh and the rivers around that because of the abundance of the of the salmon uh that wasn't the only uh type of hunting that they did uh on the point uh point of juan de fuca at just at uh, entry to the puget sound the Macaw Native American tribes would actually build these long boats and go out and hunt whales. Um, this is different than other whale hunting that happened in the rest of the Sound. They were the only group who actually would build out boats and go harpooning. The others would, uh, would hunt only beached whales. But uh, I, I like this image because it kind of dr dramatizes uh, that experience for them. This is the uh, an image of the evergreen huckleberry, which is also kind of a, uh, a common food that was uh, used by native tribes. And then this here is an uh, image of uh, Honeycrisp apples. And Washington State is very well known for their apples. In fact, Washington State produces 60% of all of the apples that are consumed in the United States. So at this point, you might be thinking a couple of things. Number one, it's like looking at your watch, wondering when is lunch? It may be your lunch hour for some of you. Uh, uh, as I'm talking about food here, but probably also you're wondering why am I talking about this? Uh, and so I wanna use this as a good introduction to what I'm going to talk about because I walked through there um, 
uh, a story from hunting to gathering to farming. And that's, I want you to think about that analogy as, as I talk about these analytic methods, because in data and analytics in healthcare, we've really kind of transitioned through the first and second part, uh, to first th to the second parts of that, where we started out, um, uh, you know, I remember when I first was working with Dale before what we now call meaningful use, and it was an institution that had uh, had already adopted electronic health records, but not fully and not everything, even though they were one of the leading organizations. And so if you wanted to get data at that time, it was basically a you eat what you kill. Uh, you had to go and figure out how to get those data collected uh, in order to use it. And now we're in what some have described a data tsunami. And even though we still may not have all of the data that we want, we have enough that as a health services researcher or as an analyst in healthcare, you can easily find a place to gather up the existing data and study it. So we're now moved to gathering. You know, this is a diagram uh, that it's interesting. They kind of stopped charting this after a while from the from ONC in terms of the adoption of electronic health records. It's I think now about around 99%, but there's more data than we ever imagined that we'd be able to deal with. And that just happened over the course of one decade. So that's pretty impressive, that movement there. But that transition, what do we do with it as we've now gone to from, uh, from hunting to gathering? Now, and you might think, well, it's a great time and maybe we should just stay here, stay there, except that when you look at cultures, gathering societies actually don't sustain, uh, aren't, aren't sustainable. They're either, uh, they usually get pushed out by uh, cultures that have figured out farming. Uh, so my goal is that we can't kind of, uh, is to talk about that we can't stay in this gathering stage, that we have to find a way to get to farming. And there are different things that we talk about uh, in as an industry about what can help with that, whether it's common data models and query tools and analytics applications. And those are things that we know can help get more people involved and going to be important to that. But broader than that are just a better understanding of the methods of using data. And that is going to be the conversation I'm gonna have with you today about what are these, what are examples of these methods of using data. Now, a lot of these you're going to have seen before. There's quite a few of them. I'm not saying that these are comprehensive, but I'm gonna tell some stories about each of these in terms of how these methods are related to using data and analysis and the importance of them, because they're, each of them are kind of make, and, make or break things. And in addition to that, just, um, reflecting on uh, how hard it is, you know, these are some of these methods are some of the things that make analytics difficult. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible, it's just something that we need to be aware of what the challenges are. And I'm gonna walk through those challenges with two out, uh, acronyms. With COVID, which is one that you're all pretty, we're all pretty familiar of right uh, now, uh, if we're not fully tired of it, but we still need to keep our, uh, keep our masks on. And with, uh, LVAD or left ventricular, ventricular assist devices, I'm gonna take you, walk you through an analysis that I uh, worked on there where it kind of shows the importance of some of these methods. So uh, this is a paper that I did, that uh, was a result of work that I did while I was working with Dale Sanders uh, at Intermountain Healthcare when I was there for the first time. And it was described where we built, uh, where we're transitioning from a uh, paper, actually it was a grease board, uh, white, uh, whiteboard tracking system for the uh, emergency department systems at Intermountain Healthcare and moved it to this electronic version. It's since been replaced as they've migrated through like everyone does into eventually commercial EHRs, but I was part of the development and the design of this system here and, it, and also part of the evaluation. So we had this and we basically replicated what had been on the grease board, but also added in the capability to link back to existing records. And when we did that, it was interesting because we found as we tracked the use of um, the, the use of the system that allowed them to quickly see, oh, someone has been here before, there's previous notes on this patient, that it actually uh, was associated with a decrease in the rate of admission or the odds ratio, odds of admission from the emergency department. Uh, as we track that over time. Now, this is one hospital and one ED uh, over one period of time. It's a difficult, and you know, it's difficult to kind of prove causality from the, that observational study or that quasi-experiment, but it was still interesting to see. That's not what I really want to focus on more. 
I want to reflect on what we saw as we worked with it with this diagram. So one of the physician uh, uh, con uh, the, the content experts uh, that we worked with, about a week after we had installed this system, and we were pretty happy with it because it was working, it wasn't crashing, and they it had done basically every function that they had asked for. Um, I talked to him uh, in a meeting about how was it going, and he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I actually hate it, which surprised me because, you know, it was, they'd been asking for something better, and, and I just kind of observed that it seemed that it was easier and more consistent in collecting information. Uh, there were some significant improvements, and I, so I kind of followed up and said, tell me, so what is it that's wrong with it? And he said, well, it's not so much the board itself that anything individually is wrong, but it used to be that I would come in to the, inst you know, to the ED and I could just quickly look at the tracking board and I could kind of tell what type of a day that was. And now I'm not able to do that anymore. I have to interpret all of the information that's here to make sense of it in order to kind of move forward. And, and I don't like that. I, uh, it's, it's frustrating to me because it's interrupting what I was able to do before. And that helped me a lot thinking about it's not just the elements that we have in terms of our, uh, in, uh, in terms of our information display that actually the sum of the parts is, uh, the, is much less than actually the whole thing. That the display itself, people got used to seeing this is a really intense day in the ED versus this is not an intense day just by the density of information and the colors that people were using. And so, it, you know, as I reflected back on that, when we think about what we're doing for information display and dense information displays, there is great value, not just in putting as much information as possible in there in ways that people can easily assimilate, but actually showing them broader things about this is what it looks like in different contexts and so they can assimilate that. And so when that's one of the important then methods is how we consider information display and that idea about the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Another example, and I'm going to go into uh, talking more about context here. So this was a project that I uh, led in New York City. It was called the Washington Heights Inwood Informatics Infrastructure for Community-Centered Comparative Effectiveness Research, which was a really long um, uh, phrase that got us a good name called WISER. So it was the WISER study, and what we were doing was integrating a lot of data sources that we had from around the system, including going out and reaching out to the, in, the people in the community and surveying them and re request a link back to the data. Now, this doesn't seem so novel now. It seems to be done much more. Uh, all of us as a program is uh, doing this at a national level, but this was back before any of those were done and kind of this precursor to a population uh, health research database. And when we were doing this, one of the uh, things that we had uh, started to do that I thought I was most proud of the investigators that they did, especially Sue Bakken, who later took over this grant, was the considering the information and how we give it back to the community. And so we studied a lot in terms of what, how do you take this information and feed it back to people so that they can understand themselves in terms of context. And this is one diagram that was studied where they looked at, you know, four different areas where you assess your health that are important for assessing health and how you might uh, reflect on that. And it wasn't just showing where you were, it was also showing what, you, what it was for other people. In some cases, that was the ideal. Uh, we have actually uh, other examples where we weren't just showing the ideal, but we were showing people around you. So sometimes it's not as helpful to show just the ideal because none of us are going with ideal. If you think about your experience <clears throat> in terms of being, uh, you know, in social isolation from COVID-19, a lot of the different things about health that may be useful to know, not just what how you are relative to ideal, but how you are doing relative to other people around you, because there is that that um, baseline seems to change across the whole populations. And so this was really important for understanding not just the data, but giving context to the data. Another important method is around sustainability. And I worked, uh, you know, stemming off of that wiser grant and, and considering the data infrastructure we were building, what did we need to do in terms of considering sustainability? And so I was eventually a, uh, a guest editor for a journal our, uh, issue all around data and sustainability. And we had one paper in this where, where we considered a lot of the issues around 
uh, sustainability, where one of the first uh, components about building a sus sustainability plan is considering what your assets were. And in this project we had, at first we thought we considered in terms of the structural assets, specifically the data, as the most valuable component. But uh, as we worked through uh, analyzing the, those assets and also looking to, at them over time, it was interesting to reflect on that the data themselves are oftentimes seen as the most important asset, but over time they become less important. In this case, um, we had these data that were not, you know, that were fully dependent on our interviews with the community. And if we stopped those interviews, then within five years, those data became pretty stale. They would still be interesting, but they, became, you know, they declined in relevance. The collaborations across the investigators in learning how to do this type of work and how to do outreach to the communities, et cetera, actually became much more sustainable and much more valuable. And looking back at it, it actually turned out that the methods that we learned, both in terms of linking of the data, in terms of understanding how to display the data in context, but also in terms um, of, uh, so linking the, with the data, understanding the data in context, but also in terms of understanding how to uh, work with different data types and their relevance and, and the patterns of those data and how they're used turned out to be even much more sustainable. And so uh, data sustainability is a critical component and, and reflects even um, not just the data, but also the other components strongly in methods, as it turns out. I wasn't involved in the work uh, directly here that was uh, on data quality, but data quality has turned out to be a very significant method that we've all experienced. And, and I hope that we've all experienced it to some degree. If you haven't, that means you're not paying enough attention to your data as you're submitting it. Um, I have rarely seen a data set that doesn't go through some, re that hasn't gone through some rigorous evaluation of its quality that isn't sent back or frustrating to the end user because it takes a lot of understanding what was really done here. And so when I was working with the, um, with the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, with their methodology committee as a member of that, and we were trying to establish what was known in the field about data quality, uh, we met with uh, group, uh, people from this group who had, who had built out this data quality assessment, specifically Michael Kahn, who was really significant in leading this group. And he had commented on, at the time, back in, and this was just five years ago, we really didn't even have a good understanding at that time of a good vocabulary around what data quality meant. People would talk about what we need to do in terms of understanding data quality, and we had a good idea of what it looked like when it wasn't good, but we didn't have a good, good vocabulary around what are the components of data quality. Eventually, this group uh, focused on specific, specific areas uh, regarding, um, you know, uh, completeness and fidelity and uh, plausibility in terms of their data. We actually took these, uh, the recommendations from that paper and included them in the PCORI methodology uh, report as, a, um, as one of the standards in telling people when you're working on, a, um, on an analysis, and actually this was important, it's not just the data set itself that needs to have quality analyzed, but for specific uses, you need to analyze the quality um, how to look at conformance and how to look at other, you know, plausibility and uh, data completeness regarding that, and if possible, then how to perform sensitivity analyses to work in that. So that's a good another example in terms of these methods of data quality. And those of us who have done it, you know, that it's not it's not like oh, you write a query, you get a report, the report populates some data, it's done. You actually have to go back and figure out. Does it look like it's supposed to? If someone if someone starts to interrogate this data, is it going to be recognized as having the right information? And that affects a lot of things. Now, just thinking about our own experience right now through COVID, we're seeing this a lot in terms of, well, what is the infection rate in different population? Um, what we're shown in terms of our data is often reflected by what can be measured, not by what's actually out there. And that's led to a lot of conversations in terms of how um, how the numbers change according to our testing rate and issues with asymptomatic um, disease. That's just a, a live and real uh, tangible example 
of the importance of understanding data completeness and data quality as an example. So another method that I want to talk about is uh, access or the democracy. Some people I've heard called this the democratization of data. Now, we all would like as many people as possible to have access to use data so they can do they can do what we call data make data driven decisions or we talk in terms of a learning health system where the information that we're able to gather from data is incorporated really easily into the decision making at the at the point of care now the challenge with that is that we talk about that as a good idea and yet we've got a significant barrier to getting there just in terms of do people have access to data to uh, in a usable way. So I built this diagram of this funnel kind of showing what the, uh, the issue was and tried to make it really tangible just in terms of how long does it take you to actually get to the data that you need. And there may be many people on this webinar who have spent a lot of time accessing data and working with it. And maybe like riding a bike, you forget how hard it was to learn to ride a bike after, after you've been riding for some time. In some sense, getting access, getting access to data or getting, uh, you know, understanding of the data can be um, something that we forget how hard it is for other people to then follow in a similar pattern. Why is it taking them so long to get to the data? Well, once they get it, it seems like everything solves. But I want to reflect on that first part: how long it takes someone to get access access to data. So if on the left side, I'm going through the different types of people that can get data, and on the right side, I'm gonna talk about how long to get, get it. And I'm gonna focus on how long and then kind of reflect on what that means for who can do it. So if it takes a minute to get data, and you think about what that looks like, that's data, dashboards, displays, information reports that people have built up, where it gives the information in an easily accessible way, that can take about a minute, and everyone can have access to that data. You know, these are broad displays, or dashboards that we give a lot a lot of access to people are able to use that pretty effectively if it takes an hour we've stopped being able to use it for what i would call uh point of care uh clinical use so the patient if especially an outpatient the patient's probably al already gone by then if it's an emergency the emergency is being addressed differently uh if it's making a decision about who i should see next and it takes you an hour to get there you've lost enough time to make that not the relevant decision anymore. So usually people, if it takes an hour to get to data, um, have to be doing things not at the patient, not at the um, at the individual interaction with patient level, they're, they're doing things more at a system level. So leaders, for example, will be able to take an hour gathering data from uh, whether it's from different sources or in complex ways in order to use that. Uh, if it takes a day to get access, to get the data that you need, uh, even leaders are not, uh, often don't have time to do that. And so there has to be another level of interest in that specific area. Uh, experts uh, may uh, often take the time to get data if it takes up to a day. Now, when you get to a week or a month, um, that the group of people who can access data when it takes a week or a month to get it, get access to that data, are generally people who have in their job description something about getting data, where that is their job. Whether it's a week and they're getting data generally, or whether it's a month and they're getting data specifically for us, you know, developing for a specific uh, task, these tend to be much more limiting in terms of who can get, get access. And all of us, when we reflect on, okay, who is it that actually has access to our data? What did it take in terms of them getting there? And all of the, the permissions will reflect that we have will generally have a group of analysts or developers who have access, and then a lot of people are at making requests through them because otherwise it's just so difficult to get there. And sometimes, actually, in some situations, the process of requesting the data may even take um, at the lower uh, at the longer end of this time. Now, so that's where we are. What do we do about it? And as I've reflected, you know, internally at both at, at different organizations I've been in, but also in my current organization, you know, we do have instances where it can take a month to get data. Usually that's because either people don't know where the sources are or they don't know what the processes are 
in terms of requesting access. And they'll spend some period of time spinning their wheels, waiting for responses on emails from different people in terms of access requesting and determining permissions. And so one of the first things that can help that is just instruction, what we call our analytics curriculum, helping people understand what data we have, what, uh, how to get access to it, what requesting and how it can be used. Going from, a, and, and that can generally, like it doesn't eliminate it to down to an, a minute, but it can speed things up, whereas before it may have taken a month, now it can be done in a week because you, you at least are steering people in the right direction to begin with. If it's taking a week to get data, oftentimes that's because you're trying to find where the data are and the, the process of going through that and uh, having to, the data coming from different sources and you're having to then build, uh, write those queries yourself and interpret all of the different uh, variables that uh, and the, you know different columns that turn out that they're significant in terms of what they represent whether uh, I mean we've all gone through this where oh I didn't realize that that was the column for a canceled visit versus all of the visits or something like that and um, what can really speed that up is actually if you build out a query library so different people have learned how to do this but, and, and sometimes it's this tribal knowledge that we work with with smaller groups, but if we're really gonna make this demo, more democratic and uh, make the access much more broadly, that tribal approach doesn't work as well. And we need to actually build out structures such as this query library to support it. Moving from a day, if it's taking you about a day to get data, that's often because um, just navigating the data structures uh, figuring out how the data are actually represented, what it means to be a visit, what table those are in, which are sometimes not very obvious. And so I'm a big proponent of actual data modeling to improve that, where you're going to build out tables. And we've moved to a point actually where you don't need to do, don't need to redefine a model. We have existing common models that one can use. But uh, if you put the data into those models, people who would before take up to a day, which was a lot of that work was just understanding how the different tables interrelated can move it into an hour. And so I think that these are really important uh, methods, both you know the analytics curriculum, building query library structures and data modeling, but their, uh, their importance is most demonstrated in terms of wh um, what does that do for who can actually now access and use the data effectively. Uh, so I, start uh, I have to say, buddy, I, I take uh, sort of pride and maybe arrogance in believing that I've thought about just, you know, nothing is new to me in this space by now, but that's the most creative way and framework that I've seen to represent this. That's, oh. that's uh, your, your physics background shines through. This is a great <laughs> framework. Thank you, Very Dale. This is probably the most original thing that I actually have on here. <laughs> um, so I actually appreciate that where, but this, this was reflecting kind of in the trenches experience, um, oh, trying to solve a problem and reflecting on what would actually do that. And that, that's kind yeah. of how we built something. What's ironic about this is you're saying that, right, is uh, I was going to this time move into talking a little bit more about maturity models. And I took those out because I'm not gonna talk to Dale Sanders' group about maturity models, given that Dale Sanders has had almost a, a decade, well, more than a decade of work in analytics and maturity models. And I can tell about my experience in using them but that's, that would be much less original. And so the contrast of you saying that <laughs> is actually pretty funny. Um, very, very nice. So I started, uh, uh, when Dale and I worked together, it was actually at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City. Um, I'm putting this up for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, we're, uh, you know, you might think, well, I started out by talking about food and now I'm gonna talk about scarcity. That's one way to think about it. Um, another way to think about it is that this is the um, the ultimate example of shelter in place uh, in <laughs> in history. But um, there's actually a deeper message that I'm going to give here about the Donner Party. Uh, and so bear with me if you can for a bit. So um, in 1846, uh, the Donner Party left from Independence, Missouri, which is where a lot of uh, um, settler settler groups traveling to the uh, to the west started from and moved trying to get to California and as they went through they did a couple of different things one was to take a shortcut and they waited for Hastings to come and tell them how to do that shortcut while they were waiting they built a road move, uh, somewhere between Little Sandy River and the Great Salt Lake Desert is it go, going through the Rocky Mountains there which later on turned out to be extremely valuable for one year later 
for the Mormon pioneers as they uh, went much of that same trail, at least getting into Salt Lake City. Um, but it turned out even more significant, while it was helpful to the Mormon pioneers, it was more significant to the Donner Party because they spent some days building that road and waiting. And then, you know, at, as it, with instructions for that cutoff, and then kind of proceeded across, got across uh, going through the Sierra Nevadas, and were just one day from summiting uh, in the Sierra Nevadas when the snows fell. So it's this tragic, and, and, you know, because of the depth of the snow, of that first snowfall that uh, they, they had to effectively shelter in place. And um, the rest of it, I'll leave, leave you to look up on Wikipedia in terms of what happened if you're not, uh, if you don't have a lot of un um, background knowledge on this, but it's a pretty tragic story of the American West uh, in terms of what those people had to do to survive. Eventually they were rescued and they got out. One of the survivors, uh, Virginia Reed, later in a letter to someone describing something said, remember, never take no cutoffs and hurry along as fast as you can. And uh, I'm making this uh, pretty dramatic uh, because, well, we're working in healthcare and analytics. The stakes are not quite the same as they were to the Donner, uh, Donner Party or the Donner Reed Party, as it's sometimes called. But reflecting on what that means for how that affects analytics and our knowledge management. <clears throat> so I had the opportunity to work at two organizations who were exceptional in terms of their knowledge management. That was uh, Intermountain Healthcare, where Stan Huff had done uh, great work in building out the health data dictionary, and Columbia University, where Jim Semino had built out the medical entities dictionary. Um, so these were two uh, knowledge management structures or vocabularies or medical ontologies, however you want to call them. Uh, as we st as I studied as a student, these were the examples that I worked with a lot, um, and they were used, you know, a lot of these definitions of, of them were used, but it was really uh, a different time then, because again, that was before in the gatherings, in the hunting stage, when you kill what you eat. And at that time, when we built these, when those for knowledge management, there was a different use of them. At that time, we talked about how data were modeled, and we talked about um, concepts and surface forms and the hierarchies of the data and how they were represented. And perhaps most importantly, the decision support needs were actually uh, driving the documentation approaches. So if we think about some of the initial requirements as part of meaningful use, uh, one of the most significant ones was the requirement for physician order entry. Why was that? What was the big change that led to people saying we need uh, physician order entry that was heavily influenced by the idea that there were uh, errors that were made in terms of um, uh, prescribing medications, dosing or drug allergy interactions, drug-drug interactions, where if we could get the people making those decisions to do it electronically, we could do decision support to test against those. And so that was a driver for this new model of documentation. And actually, uh, the continuance of that approach has led to other, pro uh, other challenges that we have faced and uh, leading to actual uh, significance in terms of physician burnout and how EHRs are being used. But that was then. Um, and if any of you have been, have been part of an EHR adoption process where they're building out the database or they're building out the system, uh, there's not as much time that gets spent in terms of building out the knowledge management as things are going through. We all know when that happens that what's, you know, on time and on or under budget is, is uh, the measurable uh, metric that people are tracking in terms of that and whether or not you take the time to build out the vocabularies as you're building them, it seems to be less important. And so while building out the vocabularies and, and the knowledge management structures may be helpful, to the people actually doing it, it could be seen like building a road when you're the Donner Party, that you're trying to get things done, because, you know, as fast as you can and trying to not take, you know, uh, trying to not miss the deadline by one day. Um, and so you're not gonna spend a lot of time with that. That's significant now that we've got this widespread adoption, but also significant in terms of the, 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 the utility of that knowledge management and how it's done. So now 
we talk much more in terms of how data are stored and data definitions and phenotypes becomes much more important. Whereas before we were thinking about ways we can model the data as it was going in, we're now looking at phenotypes as example of what are the breadcrumbs about how, what's re really being represented from different data uh, sources even. And rather than decision support driving documentation, decision support now is much more likely to be based on predictive analytics and pattern recognition approaches. And so this, I cannot um, overstate the significance of this transition in terms of the informatics uh, field and in terms of its influence on in analytics. And in fact, I still see in the field, uh, many of the leaders still gr grew up in the then stage. And I will acknowledge that, uh, not that I'm a leader, but I'm one of that population that grew up in the previous stage where, you know, in the hunting stage where we were worried about how data were modeled and we were worried about these hierarchies, et cetera. And it takes effort and a change in focus and thinking in order to move to the use of data as driving the knowledge management rather than the storage of it. Okay, so I went through those methods, information display, data context, sustainability, data quality, data access and knowledge management. Again, not to be comprehensive about what was going on in terms of um, in terms of these methods, but give an example of kind of these complex methods that are actually challenges in the field that we have to deal with. And, and uh, mm -hmm. you may hear from or you may be in conversations with people about you know why is uh, data and analytics in healthcare difficult? What are some of the reasons? These methods may be some examples that you can use for that. I, again. I think we've all experienced our own methods that may or may not fit into these uh, these examples I gave directly, but hopefully they've you know they've at least uh, added to the list of things to consider. I now want to, as I mentioned at the beginning, go through two examples, and the first one I'm going to go through is uh, around COVID. But I'm starting with an image of two uh, of the covers of two reports that I was involved with back when the in, what is now the National Institute of Med, uh, National Academy of Medicine was called the Institute of Medicine. So about eight years ago, um, for a couple, for a few years, I was on a committee that was working on um, uh, advancing uh, care for people living with HIV and AIDS. And part of that was understanding monitoring the care in the United States, looking at strategies and what were the data systems that would be required for that. And again, this was shortly after meaningful use. We didn't, you know, we hadn't moved fully to a gathering stage yet, and we were reflecting on what is possible with the EHRs in terms of monitoring this. Um, also, I think it's important to recognize, excuse me, that COVID. Is, so this was looking at HIV as and the data systems that can be used to monitor that. COVID is is the first real. Uh, big pandemic uh, where which is where we've actually passed this move from the hunting stage to the gathering stage where we have widespread adoption of EHRs and the potential to use those data and it's often when you think about it in that context it's it can be useful to reflect on well how are we doing with that and so um, with HIV when we were looking at it uh, we used uh, an important model, which was the uh, HIV, the engagement of the HIV uh, care cascade, which is a good way to reflect kind of what data you need at different stages for monitoring people. So you have a population of people that are infected, and then there are, of that, there's a smaller set that actually know that they are infected, so that they've been diagnosed. And with HIV, each of these stages, it feels like it's about 20% decline across them. So another 20% drop off between those who are diagnosed versus those who are actually linked to care, and then those who retained in HIV care and those who actually are um, have appropriate therapies, and then eventually those who have the outcomes the demonstration of the outcomes, which is expressed viral load. And this is what we used in terms of monitoring the data. And if you think about where we are with COVID, there actually is a similar treatment cascade. The, the, the percentages in terms of the drops are different. In terms of the number of people infected versus those who actually know they're infected is pretty significant. Um, it's much more than 20%. When we look at the strategy that we had with HIV, the, those that we did not know that were infected, that, that 
those that were not yet diagnosed but may have been infected, that 20% was significant enough to drive public health outreach of wearing condoms. Um, and so you have to reflect on, well, that was a 20% drop. Here we have, at some estimates, an 80% drop between those who may have COVID versus those who are actually tested positive, diagnosed as having COVID. With an 80% drop, what is the approach that you do? At first, it was shelter in place and uh, extreme social isolation. And now, you know, but the other responses and kind of thinking similarly around HIV in the same way that public health was pushing heavily for um, for use of condoms uh, broadly, uh, the use of masks would be a similar prophylactic or barrier approach to because you don't know how many who was in you're not positive of who would be infected versus who was actually tested positive for it. Um, I just, hey, Adam, I just want to comment on that slide for okay. you. Go back. I one of the uh, concerns I have with COVID is that I don't see at a national level a framework of thinking as reflected in this slide, right? We should, you can cut and paste HIV and replace it with COVID. And this right. is how we should be thinking about COVID. Um, and it might be happening at institutions, but at the federal level, I don't see any evidence that it is. And um, I think that's just worth noting. Um, um, and I'm gonna bring that up. In fact, I'm gonna use this slide in conversations related to this at the federal level. Thanks for bringing this up, it's yeah, a great, to look at it. No problem. Well, it, what I like about this is this is a really good example of a data-driven, you know, you know the, the the model of a care cascade is not unique to HIV, as I mentioned. Right. But it, the data are really informing, the data across this are really informing the approach. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the, the later stages in terms of what it means to be diagnosed and what it means to be cared for appropriately. And it may be with COVID since there's, you know, there's varying approaches, but one of the most important one is, you know, in term because the spread is so significant, um, the equivalent to link to care may be that you're diagnosed and actually that you're uh, informed about what you need to do for social distancing and core quarantining, mm -hmm. you know, self self isolation and quarantining, and that those around you may be and and what you do, and then and then also that you're actually monitoring and getting the appropriate care and escalation of care. As you need, it would be useful to kind of go through that exercise because I, I agree. I don't think we know what the numbers are. We have no. vague ideas about that first step <clears throat> that it's around an 80% drop, which is huge. It may be similar, like how many people that are tested positive are actually self isolating. Um, you know, I'll, <laughs> it feels like <clears throat> we have so many examples of people who you know, these super spreader events where one person that was sick that decided to still go out in public and what they're linked to, there seems to be some gap there. Um, even if it's not, you know, you're tested positive, that symptomatic, uh, the issues of just even being symptomatic may be a way to reflect on that. Yeah, so, and, and with that kind of a framework, you know, you really have a different data strategy for each of yep. the steps in the cascade. Totally right? agree. I yeah. mean, there's some overlap, but there's a lot of differences in the data that you're collecting on the left side of this screen, which is kind of public health data versus the right side, which is real world data, real world evidence for outcomes. Yeah, and, and I cannot I cannot understate how or overstate how important this diagram was to these reports because yeah. when we reflected on what were the data systems that we need needed, it was specifically based on, well, what do you need at each stage? And the idea yeah. that just one would cross all of them was really flawed. It took a very, like, kind of a surgical, uh, very specific approach to it. Mm -hmm. So early on with COVID, um, I, so I'm in Seattle. Uh, we are not the greatest hotspot currently. Um, we've been surpassed in being a hotspot by lots of states, uh, but we were the first one. And initially, when it started, I remember looking at our data, and we, you know, well, other people may have had a hundred. We ha quickly had four thousand cases and was wondering what can we do in terms of providing this data out for other people to analyze. And I actually even reached out to a colleague at the CDC um, saying, we've got these data, what can I do to be helpful so other people can learn from our experiences we're going forward? And that was you know, back early March. I did not anticipate the, it spreading like this where, where everyone else would have experienced it at much drastic ways. I 
don't think anyone anticipated what was going to happen in New York until we started seeing the data. But I got back from the CDC this this is a request to complete this table. And I'm just going to kind of reflect on what they were really asking for here and, and what is one of the examples of what makes analytics hard. So this was for each week. Can you provide for us? And this is just for an understanding of where th of the people being cared for and stuff. The people in ambulatory care, urgent, ED, in the hospital or in the ICU, um, in or in in the hospital and in the ICU. Information on, you know, the totals, the number that are tested, the number of positive, so we get an idea of the penetration for how how widespread is this, and across these different age groups. Um, that's a lot of data. Yeah. It's actually what's interesting is it's it's less data. I mean, at the time we have may have had uh, four thousand tests, and about that point they were around ten percent positive. So four hundred. 400 positive instances and they wanted this by week and so by this time we'd gone through uh, a couple of weeks two or three so and then they also requested can you get this for um for different race and ethnicity as well so that if you calculate that there's five categories three each across the uh, you know going down so that's 15 times seven age categories is 105 multiplied by however you want to divide out the race and ethnicity um, we quickly have more queries or more cells in this table than we actually had people positive for the disease, and you know, and we were the hotspot at the time. It's not that way anymore, again, but still, that like I don't know who can provide this type of data reasonably, yeah, um, on call to organizations. And so, just because we had the data didn't mean that we could make it useful, because this reflects kind of well. In order to use it, this is what they had to do. This was a real eye opener. Oh my gosh. You just don't, if we're going to be providing data for you like with these reports, we're not going to be able to do it. What would it take to give you access to it? And could we do that? And that we really haven't reached that point. In fact, I, uh, I've i been participating in what's called the National COVID Co Cohort Collaborator, N3C. Uh, this is not the only uh, COVID sharing uh, initiative out there, but it's a significant one currently. Um, and it was, uh, it, it started, uh, with some work on a grant that I was uh, one of the investigators on, with which was C, uh, CD2H, which was funded by National Center um, National Center for Advancement of Translational Science or NCATS, where we we're trying to build out like a structure for people to share data. You know, academic medical centers can you share together information from COVID? And as we were talking about this initially, I was I had advocated strongly for this because one of the points I made is I feel like we're at the point. You know, we've spent a decade now, post, you know, you know, after meaningful, you know, where we went through meaningful use, a decade post the high tech rules, where we were worried about the sharing of information and the breaches. We've spent a decade where analytics is general uh, of healthcare data has generally been performed by analysts within those organizations. And a decade, you know, a decade into this. I can look at it and say, I don't think we're going as well as, as fast as we need to for this. I think like we're limited by the number of analysts that we have within those organizations. And I experienced this within COVID, like we have really good analysts at the University of Washington, but we don't have so many that we can be answering every question. Wouldn't it be nice if we could open this up in some way and make it a safe way to share these data, at least for COVID, um, with other people who can then bring their analytic skills to bear on this and actually help us all. And so that was kind of one of the um, motivators for this initiative. And so we started working on, okay, let's let's share data. <laughs> um, and and this is, so I had uh, 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 an analyst working on our team who had finished, just finished his PhD, but more important than that, before that he had worked in government. And so he was pretty good at kind of uh, documenting what the steps were. And we said, like as we tried to share data, can you document what it took for us to actually get to the point where we shared data? And so we went through this process. And bear in mind, this is in a pandemic when there's when people are recognizing the importance of doing this, and we've got national support for this of what it actually takes to share data. So on the left side, you know, building the data out into a common model that was actually the easiest part about this. Um, 
the approvals in terms of research and the IRB determination, and then we used a centralized IRB, and that uh, um, that caused some more, like how that integrates into the process caused some delays, and then just getting the organization to agree because there are there are organizational privacy issues that need to be addressed, even if you can do it in a limited data set and have it secure enough. Um, there are some of those issues to be addressed, and then actually the process of that finalizing those organiza or organizational agreements and doing it. Like, there's a lot of steps in here. So it was really important for me to kind of see that just because we can share data doesn't mean we actually are able to. Just because it's possible doesn't mean it's facilitated and doesn't mean that you can do it in what would be considered an emergency and a desire to do it quickly. And it was kind of shocking to realize the difficulty of doing that. And those two things about the need for sharing data, but our ability to share data, the need for sharing data so that organizations who need it aren't dependent on analysts querying out, um, as I showed here, a thousand data elements for that. Um, but they could have access directly if it were in a common model and the need for actually sharing this and so we can pool data together and understanding together. Uh, it was disappointing on both points about what it would really take. And I think that this is one of those areas where we're going to need to do better and we're going to need to take the lessons learned from here. So last of all, let me just go through this example and I'll go through it quickly in terms of what we discovered on. So that was my COVID story. And now let me talk a little bit more about uh, left ventricular assist devices. So these are for people that are pretty sick. Uh, it's where you have a device that comes in and helps their heart move blood around. Um, the people, like these are historically high risk populations. The, if you're looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve in the upper right corner, it shows that after five years, about 50% of the people have died from this. Causes of death are usually related to bleeding or not bleeding, uh, you know, or clotting in some way. So most common cause of death is stroke. The most common adver adverse event for those that don't die is internal bleeding or other two within the top five or stroke or re-exploration for bleeding. So a lot of the issues around these, um, around these use of LVADs are going to be affected by bleeding. There's two ways that they can kind of monitor the bleeding. The most commonly used model is a, where someone uses a partial thromboplastin time or a PTT, which measures the time it takes for a blood clot to form. And we were looking in our organization, at, should we be using a, new, a different measure, which is called heparin anti-10A uh, or factor 10A, or 10A, I'll use either of those to, to describe it, which measures the amount of heparin by its inhibition of factor 10A activity. And you can see the therapeutic ranges here that are used. So the first thing we did is we said, well, we've got, we actually had a lot of data. We had thousands of data points of, um, <clears throat> actually, I think it was about over 6,000 data points uh, where we had taken both PTT and anti-10A measurements on individuals. And we first wanted to see, well, did they always match up? And if they didn't, what was the issue? And so we first built out this dis uh, discordance or discrepancy matrix. And you can see from this that in general, there's that 47%, which seems to be pretty high on where factor 10A is listed as medium, but PTT is listed at high. When we actually plotted out the various points on here, we saw that, yes, that was the case, that there was a big, that uh, middle right uh, cell was was pretty packed there. And as we looked into it in more detail, we kind of looked at some issues around the data bias. So PTT, again, the therapeutic range there was, um, let's see, was 60 to 100. And you're seeing there that it's kind of biased, biased high, whereas uh, factor 10A, it's biased low. And you know the spikes, those of you who've worked with lab data, know that that's what happens when you fill in everything that's le less than 0 0.01 or greater than 200, what you do with those data points. We put them all to a one or then 0 0.09. And then we looked at, okay, well, let's, what's going on? Are these representing the same thing? They're not quite, but well, let's look at these distributions. There wasn't much that we could see in terms of the distributions between uh, PTT value frequency and those who bled of differences versus factor 10A, it didn't really reveal that one was better than the other in terms of separating out the, like having a bimodal distribution. We also looked at regression lines for that when we plotted out uh, the points. And while there was a difference that factor 10A was more and was better at predicting um, bleeding, uh, no one's going to change healthcare based on a, on a um, uh, regression lines 
on data like this. That's just, mm -hmm. there's, it's just too, there's too much uncertainty there. And then we even did ROC curve analysis. Finally, actually what we did is we had to model the clinical decision, which is a threshold decision where we looked at it and said, okay, so if someone has, uh, if we choose a threshold at some level, whether it's PTT or factor 10A, what's the probability of bleed above that level? And so we modeled that threshold decision, which, you know, Stephen Palker uh, in the 80s kind of talked about the, the threshold decision making of medicine. And, but we, you know, we hadn't actually defaulted this. What's notable is everything until this point are kind of the standard analyses that one would do. Um, and what actually m most of the machine learning or statistical analyses would do. When we did it this way, I actually noticed an immediate separation between them where factor 10A was, uh, there was actually um, a clear distinction that as, at higher levels, it was able to detect uh, higher bleeding, whereas PTT really didn't do so much. And so we actually used, like this is the chart that we used to change how we were using uh, these different lab results for monitoring bleeding for these patients in our hospital. Now, the most interesting story though is actually how we got here. So what had happened was we had in our system eight bad outcomes in a row. And when you have eight bad outcomes in a row, and given this is like the, the bad outcomes for this, this is highly, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of negative outcomes in terms of bleeding or uh, bleeding events or, or stroke events or death. So if you think about that as a 50% odds, what's the probability of flipping a coin eight times and coming up heads? Well, you know, it's one over 256. You'd say that, oh, of course we've got to investigate. Something is wrong here. And the doctors started to investigate those eight cases. And one of the things they came up with was there seems to be this difference between factor 10A being more predictive than PTT. And then we went and took the data, 6,000 plus measures, and all of this analysis just to demonstrate what they found out at first. So all we were doing was re is giving the data behind what they had already detected with eight cases. How would that happen? What is it about people and their ability to look at data? And more importantly, what is with this odd? So as it turns out, <clears throat> that coin flip probability they said, this one over 256, it's actually not that. We had over a period of a few years, over 200 um, instances of uh, LVAD use. And so if we're looking for what's the probability when you have of a run of eight across 200, that's much more frequent. It turns out it's not just one over 256. You got about a one in three chance of seeing over that time, sometime where you're gonna have a one of eight. So it's because of that, that they stopped and then they looked at it. And then because people are really good at identifying patterns, they're not really good at interpreting trends, but they're really good at identifying patterns. They picked up the pattern that it took us all of that analytics work to figure out. And I've reflected on that a lot saying, what is it that we could do better with data? Because we could have found eight negative instances long before we waited for it to be eight at once, eight in a row. We could have looked at, you know, showing people, you know, having them do chart biopsies on eight negative examples. And they probably would have noticed this pattern much earlier and we probably would have been able to improve a lot better and what can we do and kind of the consideration that maybe what leads to improvement is giving people is being smart about how we use the data to identify the right clusters that then allow those who are able to see the patterns best to see them so i'm at this point going to stop and turn it over to brooke great thanks adam um, so we know it is the top of the hour. We will stay on for a few more minutes. We can ask some questions. If you have um, time to stay on, please submit your questions on the GoToWebinar um, pane right now. Um, I do want to mention our um, HAS Summit before we jump into our Q&A, um, our Healthcare Analytics Summit. It will be held virtually this year, September 1st to the 3rd. And our theme is on the role of data and analytics in our new normal with COVID. And we'll be featuring speakers who've battled COVID in the trenches, as well as other speakers who are adjusting and pivoting to this new normal. And we plan to provide a unique and innovative virtual experience. We're going to have some nationally recognized keynote speakers, a few of which you can see on this slide. We'll be announcing a few more um, soon. And we'll also have some individual connection points with our analytics walkabout, with our networking, with our brain date, and other virtual activities. So we're really excited for what we have planned. And we hope you'll be able to join us. Registration is now open. You can register at hassummit.com and it's $99 per registrant. And right now we want to give away three complimentary passes to HAS. So if you know that you're going to be able to attend and you're interested in being considered for one of these three passes, um, please answer this poll question that I am just about to launch. 
So leave that open for just a minute for everyone to answer. And um, we'll just give you a few seconds to answer. And then I've got one more poll question and then we'll jump into the Q and A. Let's give you a few more seconds. And thanks to everyone for staying on and um, listening to what we have to offer today. Yeah, I can stay. Adam, can you stay for a little while? Yeah, I can stay for a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. And also, to anyone that needs to jump off, we are recording this. So if you need to leave and you miss the Q&A session, you can listen to it later. We will include that. All right, I'm going to close this poll. And we've got one more poll question for you. So while today's webinar was focused on real world analytics and advancing methods and literacy in healthcare, some of you may want to learn more about the work the Health Catalyst is doing in this space, or maybe you'd just like to learn about our other products and professional services. So if you'd like to learn more, please answer this poll question. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave that open while we jump into the Q&A. So Dale, I'll let you um, look at the questions we have coming in and kind of um, see if we can answer as many of those as we can. All right, thanks Brooke, thanks Adam. Really interesting stuff there, friend. I've got a bunch of questions, and there's several in our uh, from our audience here. Um, I want to go back to the um, the pattern recognition that humans can sense these patterns, and you were essentially validating those patterns with the data around the the LVAD patients, right? Yeah, I love that, friend, and I agree with that. And the old and this will sound cliche, but the older I get, the better I am at pattern recognition, right? You just kind of build up expertise. I wonder if there's we should as analysts and data people in healthcare. I wonder if we should occasionally make room in our day for having conversations with the frontline care workers um, about the patterns that they're seeing that they they're probably stuffing away in the back of their mind but they don't always verbalize but if they were prompted it might lead us to identify patterns and then investigate with data uh, to see whether those patterns are valid or not what do you think about that how do we get to the pattern recognition part of the human brain as data analysts yeah so let me give you an example of that um, and this is actually a credit so this happened the second time i was at intermountain healthcare i was working with a primary care clinical program. And it was based on the work, Dale, actually, that you had done um, in terms of there and building up the warehouse. So I was meeting with a group and they were going through the diabetes, um, the, the, the indicators. And, and so they were really good at kind of building up incentives and, and helping people track their patients that were, um, you know, that were meeting certain criteria of quality, you know, of high quality care you know but not everyone met them and, and in this meeting one of the doctors said you know i actually took that report and i went and i uh pulled out from that all of the individuals that i had were not meeting these metrics and then i went and looked into their chart about this and i noticed something and and so like what he noticed is actually less important than the process so think about what he had to do he had to take a report he had to effectively run that same report or the query. I don't know whether, you know, at the time we didn't have the equivalent of slice or dice or some other query tool within the EHR. Um, but he had to th run that query to gather those individuals, browse into, you know, choose a set of them, browse into their record. And just by looking at it, like 10 of them, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was quickly able to identify some pattern that wasn't necessarily in the data. So I, mm -hmm. I think that that's going to be perhaps the most important part <clears throat> those chart biopsies and enabling those chart bi biopsies mm -hmm. what is it that we can do now if it's just us reviewing the chart and understanding what's documented in there if it's the clinicians getting them to be able to see that information because i i think there's probably a, you know when i reflect on what that doctor was talking about some of those elements i think were things that actually weren't documented in the chart but he just knew the patients and started mm -hmm. to see those patterns so the more that we can do to get the, you know, to what I, it's, it, what I like to call is um, subpopulation analysis and to make it easy for people to drill in to those instances within there, I think that's going to be what's going to generate the, the greatest kind of, uh, knowledge generation, those hypotheses that then we can use data to determine. Because that's actually all we did with the LVAD is that we, there was a hypothesis, we just validated it. 
Yeah, right. So maybe the lesson for those of us in the analytics world is that we we're, we should be a little more proactive about conversations yeah. with, uh, especially, and I, and, I, and I mean this very sincerely, especially with the folks who've been around for a while, right? Because you build up pattern recognition the longer you're in an in environment. And, uh, and ask them, are they seeing any patterns? And then from that, generate hypotheses that you can test with analytics, right? I love that concept. Right. And I, I think you're really onto something there. I love the term, uh, the term chart biopsy too. <laughs> <laughs> that one but I did you, not make up. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Right. Subpopulation mm -hmm. analysis and chart biopsies. Those two, I actually, the one is analytics driven and the other is, um, is, dr is the drill down uh, and there's scientific methods to do each of those. Right. But I actually think that is the bit much more right now. And, and I may, uh, I hope I don't offend people by saying this, but, much more important than machine learning much yeah. more important than predictive analytics would be those yeah activities. yeah i think so too friend i think you're onto something there i want to i want to figure out how to propagate that concept in the industry um speaking of chart biopsies what's a data phenotype oh okay so a, a good example would be and um you can think of this because i remember when steve barlow and you or when I first met you guys and you were just building out the, the data mart for diabetes. So what does it mean that someone has diabetes? Well, they can have diabetes because someone documented that they had the condition as a diagnosis code. They can have it because their hemoglobin A1C is above some value, or they can have it because they're being treated with metformin or other medications that you use for treating uh, diabetes. So the phenotype, uh, the way I, like, uh, I best describe it, and I don't have a formal definition, but with, with that is, it's a definition of the combi combination of those different data sources that indicate the broader finding, which is patient has diabetes. That yeah. is the phenotype. And the phenotype definition, is you, in that case, as you notice, isn't something that can be defined just by a vocabulary because it's crossing three different data sources. Mm -hmm. it's, more, it's a more complex analysis of what, what it means to have diabetes. Yeah, I like that concept. It's how... What's the expression of the disease in data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's very interesting. Which, by the way, has been quite a challenge with COVID. And um, I, I, I'm, I think we all, I'm thinking I need to, and maybe you can help. Um, the notion and the importance of a registry, like a COVID registry, Yes. And right. And recognizing the subtleties of that data phenotype in that COVID registry. I'm seeing across the country there's um, a, there's a need for sort of registry continuing medical education or something. Um, yeah. I see a lot of struggles around um, just understanding the concept of a COVID registry and then the subtleties of its design. And, and I like your term data phenotype. Yeah. And it's not just for COVID. I mean, in places mm -hmm. where they've had to move the ice, expand ICU capacity, it's uh, it's no longer that they're on some floor that they're in the ICU. It's what right. treatments they're getting, other things like that. Yeah. Um, the uh, there was a question from Rob Nauman in the audience. Is that back to your um, time to get data slide? Is there a time frame between the minute and hour that keeps it in the point of care model? A time frame between the minute and hour, so tens of minutes or something that keeps it in the well. Point of so, care. so it depends on it depends on the the setting, right? If it's a fifteen minute primary care visit, um, the doctor can't spend those full fifteen minutes trying to dig something up, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And and so you think about how long. And and you reflect on the information of the in, info button. How long will a doctor spend going digging down to try and answer a question, rather than um, focusing on more gathering of information or you know other interactions with the with the patient? And I I don't know that we figured that, but we know it's not 15 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. But right. in in that case, now with others. Um, you know, I've talked to doctors, you know, especially hospitalists who may spend longer trying to figure out a difficult patient and stuff. And so that kind of can be, you know, because, you know, their residents or, you know, the attendings in, in the hospital setting, that, that can be a little longer. 
um, in outpatient care, it could be limited. Um, so, so I don't know, but I don't think it's, uh, I think it's on the lower end of, uh, yeah. between, you know, closer to a minute than an hour. Yeah, me too. I think you made it closer to seconds, right? I would, I would say that there's a time frame below minute, uh, right? Yeah. Second. Yeah. Right. Um, back now, back switching gears here, going to the HIV cascade slide. How long did it take to settle in on those values and sort of work through that cascade, both the development of the framework as well as the data required? So I, I, it, there's a question, which is how long did it take experts in the field to settle in on the treatment cascade as a way of defining that? And yeah. I don't know when, you know, when I was working on that, that uh, with that group, I wasn't the HIV expert. I was the, an informatics expert who had joined in with it. So I right. didn't have a lot of detail for that. Um, it would, so I, I think that, the, uh, you know, HIV in terms of treatment and, and filling out the rest of that cascade and, and diagnosis of it, it'd been around for a couple of decades. Um, I think it probably, as the people were trying to figure out what it meant, looked a lot more like, you know, the, uh, not confusion, but, you know, the lack of information on across the whole thing that we have had had have with COVID is was probably in you know similar with HIV as they were pursuing different methods and trying to understand it. But you know there's you know they you're going to try the people that you're treating, helping the people that you're seeing directly, you're going to figure out from public health how to how to prevent it from coming. It the cascade became a really good way of reflecting on what are the issues and of organizing around the data. Um, yeah. And I think that because of that, it was probably, I'm going to guess it was probably uh, a few years into the pandemic that, that they came up with that, but I don't know the full history. I just know it was really, really useful when mm -hmm. we were identifying what are the data sources, what are the data needs and those data sources. And I, I yeah, treatment cascades sort of trend, you could also in some way call it, um, or not cascade, uh, treatment cascade, but disease cascade the uh, transitions of care is also kind of a similar concept and measuring the movement of a patient through its disease state yeah. um, is, is an interesting observation for me in COVID. And I, so I'll, I'm going to throw out um, some comments here and I'd love to hear you react to these. So um, EHR data content has been influenced by ONC, Right, so interoperability and the mission right. of ONC has influenced what we collect in an EHR. Uh, it's been influenced by CMS and payers, and those motivations have been around quality measures and reimbursements. And those motives are reflected in the data that we're collecting in an EHR. And so I would argue that the, today's EHR is sort of the content is dominated by the motives coming from interoperability, quality measures, and reimbursements. And what I see in COVID very starkly is a lack of adequate real world data and evidence to pursue cascades of care understanding and also um, outcomes analysis. And there's, and so think about that for a second. And then I'm, I want, to also advocate that I think someone federally, if not federally, did I lose you, Dale? Yeah, Dale, we're we're not hearing you. I don't know if you went on mute on accident. So hoping he comes back on. Let me reflect on trying to answer where I think he was going with his question. <laughs> so. <laughs> what do you think about that? And also comment on OMOP and, and Odyssey and yeah. So I mean, we're in the middle of COVID, and and when I look at what we're trying to do with N3C, you know, if you were to build a registry with with um, HIV care, it's much more easily defined because we have enough experience with the condition that we kind of know what data elements to track. And so one of the things that you didn't mention that drives care is also, or I mean that drives data that we have, is also a clear understanding of what data are important. And I don't think we've reached the full point now yet with COVID. I mean, there's questions, is it the blood type that's most, you know, that actually leads to it? You know, a lot of the different hypotheses are flying. If we were to build a registry 
with again with HIV, we kind of know most of the elements. With COVID, I think there's probably more that we don't know in terms of data elements that we would need. We could have a pretty good idea of the first of you know the first hundred, but or, or maybe the first probably the first thirty. But after that, there's going to de be debates on whether that's really important or not. Um, and I'm just reflecting on you know we didn't realize that race, race and ethnicity information was going to be more important than you know than so many other things at first and we're still learning a lot mm -hmm. so i think it's kind of the maturity of an understanding of what data elements are most important in the uh you know and there there are billing influences but we're still um we're still not sure of what you know billing influences that have changed a lot of the quality metrics that have been documented have been because of definitions of what quality care looks like. I don't think we know yet what quality care looks like for COVID. And so, uh, and that's one of the reasons to want to use a common data model like OMOP where you can grab a whole bunch as you figure this out. Uh, so you have flexibility. So, you know, rather than saying we're going to, we don't know enough yet to build a registry, we can say, well, we know enough to start and if we get the data models as well, then maybe we can uh, abstract from that as we go. I mean, yeah. you think about those 300 plus elements that the CDC was asking for, they weren't quite sure that all of those were needed either, but we hadn't defined kind of best practices of data. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen uh, at the federal level, a convening of the major EHR vendors. And in that, um, in those meetings, an iterative process around defining the minimum viable data sets that we needed for outcomes analysis around COVID from the beginning, realizing that it's going to be, you know, chaotic and nebulous in the beginning, um, but lay down a minimum viable data set that the EHR vendors then would take out to their deployments and help implement, and then that flows up, we learn from it, we iterate, we improve. Now, that yeah. also assumes that the EHR vendors have the ability to quickly turn that thing around, which generally speaking, they don't um, because of the architectures and, and things like that. But I think that's where we've got to start thinking as a country. Um, and we've got to recognize that the, the, the real world data that we have right now isn't as great as we think it is. And someone needs to own that space. Right. Well, so so actually credit to the EHR vendors and the and the federal institutions. I think they actually did that to some degree, but not not as widespread. And I don't think they did a convening across them. But I know that they did work with Epic and I think Cerner directly in terms, you know, the querying of those data that I showed. I think that they went to the EHR vendors as a place that was at least convening multiple sources of data rather than asking in each institution to kind of track that. I think yeah. they were pretty innovative in that way. Now, I will argue that that doesn't solve all of the problem because that still limits the analysis down to then the EHR vendors analytics because they're the only right. ones who have access to all of it. And I think that's a big problem uh, and that's something that we need to solve. But, uh, um, and the fact that they didn't, and, and I don't know, you know, it may have been because there was concern if people found out they were doing that they may have complained about the use of data and stuff like that. And in the fog of war or the fog of the pandemic, a lot of decisions, you know, we all see within our organization things that we chose to do that maybe if we had known what we know now, we would have chosen differently. I think they have tried to do that, but I, even if they've been successful about that, I don't think that's the final solution, or I, I don't think that's right. the, necessarily a complete solution because I think that there, um, it's a more efficient solution than waiting for everyone else to figure out how to share data, and my diagram kind of showed that. But I, I would hope that we get better at sharing data so that there's, so that um, if there's something else like this, and there will be, maybe not like a infectious disease pandemic, but something of national interest where data sharing are, is important, there will be other things and hopefully we can figure that out. Yeah, and I'll give credit to the MITRE Mayo Coalition for serving as a convening body of sorts. So I was part of an initial group of um, Health Catalyst, Cerner, Epic, and All Scripts, where we got together under that concept of a minimum viable data set, but we never quite got there in terms of changing what data was being collected formally in the EHRs. 
Um, and of course, the minor male coalition is kind of all about goodwill and a little bit distant from actual care delivery. So I'm still I, I'm still biased towards I think someone federally needs to own this space, and I think FDA might be the place to do it. But we'll see how that goes. Yeah, FDA or okay. ONC or yeah. Let me. Uh, there's a question here um, from Carol Coates. I don't know if Carol's still on, but we've got 87 people on. Um, will we be? Uh, we will be implementing Epic in 2021. Do you have any guidance on reports that provide just-in-time analytics by patient population that we can put on provider dashboards? <laughs> so, so at UW Medicine, we will be going live on uh, Epic. We have it outpatient, but full inpatient in 2021 as well. So um, I don't know that yet. We're still figuring that out. I'm at your mm -hmm. stage in terms of ask, uh, wondering that, Carolyn, trying to figure that out. I, I would defer to people who have more experience with Epic directly on that. I believe that, you know, that, that that's probably a good, I, I don't know if they have those webinars exactly, but the lessons learned of what you need to know after, you know, what, what, what are the real things that make a difference in terms of success um, not just determined by the EHR vendors as they're coming in, but by people who have gone through that meeting together and convening and saying that. And there's probably those groups going on. We just are not yet to the other side of it. But I would hope that those, uh, the information from those would be useful for those coming afterwards. Yeah. And I would, I'll answer at a very high level that um, the important thing is to is to think less about all of the possible analytics use scenarios that you might need and more about the infrastructure of data that can support lots of use cases no matter what comes up and one of the problems that we see as a an analytics vendor and also in covid um, is lack of standard terminology so it gets back to you know jim Cimino and dan huff right and the lack of standard terminology um, is a real problem in COVID, and it continues to be a real problem in EHRs to support um, reusable and consistent analytics. So, yeah. for for instance, you know, lab harmonization is in general pretty bad across the industry. It's been uh, we've implemented lab harmonization as sort of uh, um, you know testing or, or preparing for the test around meaningful use and that kind of thing, but beyond those core requirements for reporting lab values are not well harmonized in the country and that limits the analytic use cases you can support so spend time on the data strategy and um, involve you know as you deploy epic involve informed analytics folks in the deployment so that the design and the configuration of epic um, is informed from the back end uh, as as much as it is from the front end um, okay, let's see here, friend. Let's uh, ask another question here. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions I don't understand, unfortunately, and so I don't, I won't go there. Let's go to this one from Brett Johnson. Provider pattern recognition in the weekly mortality morbidity stats. Were you able to build out survival trees from the groups? With age, did you start to see real-time leading indicator patterns from pharmacy, e.g., steroids with outcomes? Hmm. Uh, so yeah, that that type of analysis, no. And in, I mean, we built out some data displays internally that the ICU docs and the residents were looking at and trying to understand kind of what the, that survival and just for that for them it was these questions of we'd like to know what we're doing and what eventually happens to these individuals. Um, those analyses we haven't done. I think that they're probably better done at places where they're, they're, they've spiked more. I mean, University of Washington would be a good place to just to study the spread and mm -hmm. how we kind of monitor the spread. Uh, New York and New Jersey would be good places to study kind of in uh, ICU treatment. We just yeah. didn't, we just didn't have as many people intubated in in the ICUs. We had a lot of people. Like I think our total um inpatients was around 400 so far i mean we're still tracking it but yeah at uw medicine yeah okay let's go one more question friend we're down to 72 people um 
you've been around analytics forever, friend. And when we were at Intermountain way back when, there were no vendors in the data warehousing space. Now there are dozens, including the EHR vendors. And the cloud has made homegrown data warehouses appear to be easier. So where do you, where, what are your thoughts about this space and in, in, in the role that vendors are playing like Health Catalyst, EHR vendors, homegrown? What are your thoughts and advice to the attendees about how to approach an analytics strategy from a, um, from kind of a technology vendor, build your own space? Yeah, so that's a good question. And if I had included the information on maturity models, I would have pointed out what I think, it, you know, and, and, and Dale, you're the one who built out the healthcare analytics adoption model. Um, I So the, the first thing that usually throws things out, that, that makes things difficult is the ability to centralize data. Mm -hmm. um, and where, you know, if someone has a homegrown data warehouse, even within an institution that has a regular data warehouse, and they've built something homegrown, it usually starts because, well, they had this data source that they needed to also include that they couldn't put into the warehouse because they didn't have quite, you know, the, you know, the institutional mandate or the, you know, the funds to do so, but they, and so they ended up instead kind of building their a localized database where they were centralizing things so they could query them together. Like that usually starts it. And then, um, it's, but it also starts eventually people saying, well, we need these other data. And so it pushes them towards the centralized uh, database for the institution as well. But, you know, if they're one-offs, it's usually because they're, because they're gathering the data together uh, or they're trying to gather the, to get all of the data in the same place so we're easy in query. I think, you know, and, and that, that's pretty, that's really significant. It, you know, the design, initial design of warehousing often is indicated most by what uh, what were the efforts around central around gathering data in one place so you can mm -hmm. um, the problem is is that the uh, that can either become a friend or a foe to level two, which is actually organizing the data. Um, and I have seen. You know, within our own organization, we have activities that are centralizing data, but we have also uh, other people um, that are centralizing, you know, with you know, that are localizing the data. And often, what leads to that is kind of the local use of the data, because perhaps there's not a is flex a flexible way for them to define those, you know, the, those phenotypes or the the in, uh, mm -hmm. information about the use of the data. I think that we underestimate the significance of the data organization and the importance of sharing that information. Um, it's not that different, like even at the simplest level, I would at least start by figuring out how to um, how to organize query libraries together in an effective way that you know you can update them and that people can query them. And sometimes vocabulary is going to represent them. But and then all next figuring out if you're going to be uh, you know, building your local copy of it, why wouldn't you use a, com a common data model? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to put it in that way, but you're eventually gonna be modeling data anyway. So I'd, I'd go back to that funnel diagram that if you can follow those things, you're actually gonna get greater benefit at the end. So yeah. does that answer your question? I mean, you're you, uh, you, actually, I'd like you to reflect on it because all I'm doing is quoting your maturity model. <laughs> well, it's an interesting space to be in, you know, as a vendor. Um, on the one hand, certainly the cloud has made homegrown data warehouses um, easier. You know, I used to be well known for knowing how to engineer the infrastructure of data warehouse. Now, I don't really care about that. The cloud has taken care of that engineering infrastructure for us in ways that I never could in the past. The challenge is in the layers above the infrastructure now yeah. you know, and, and scaling a homegrown data warehouse is pretty darn hard it's pretty expensive um the ehr vendors you know traditionally come from a background that's not about data warehousing and analytics it's about data capture um so it'll be interesting to see how they evolve and catch up to that space um and it, yeah so it there's there's good options probably worth a separate webinar to talk about how to make that decision okay all right friend 
we, All right. we, we have to jump. I really appreciate you, Adam. And I thank everyone that hung on and um, keep doing good work out there, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Again, you know, so thanks much. so much. It was wonderful yeah. to talk with you. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you, Brooke.